I'm Anjanette Levy, and we are live from Walterboro, South Carolina, and you are watching Law and Crime. And I told you we had some special guests coming up, and look, here they are, the, the gentlemen of the week, uh, uh, the leaders of the prosecution team, Creighton Waters, Assistant Attorney General, who's uh, leading this prosecution and the investigations, and Attorney General Alan Wilson. Gentlemen, thanks so much for being here. Um, Thank you. How are you feeling right now? Yeah, the word I've been using is elated. Your word? I think the word I've been using is probably numb and exhausted, but uh, in a good way. I, I think that uh, we still had court this morning, and so I still had to keep focused. And uh, obviously, the aftermath of this is still starting to sink in. So, yeah. uh, Were you surprised that none of the victims' families? I'm not talking about. I, I didn't expect the, the Murdoch family, but maybe some of Maggie's family members, were you surprised they didn't want to speak? No, and, and I, I need to be sensitive and obviously say this in the right way. This is a very complicated situation uh, for this family, and I want to be clear, this case is not about anything more than uh, Maggie and Paul at its at its core. Uh, and this family has suffered, okay, and there's uh, they've not only suffered, but they had to suffer in a very public way. And so we were very sensitive and actually made a decision early on that we were going to service, uh, provide victim advocate services to the family regardless of where an individual family member uh, felt about the case or what side they were on, if you want to put that way, or whatever. And we, we tried to do that. Uh, we were going to be mindful and respectful of them regardless of their views. Uh, and I think that, you know, in the aftermath of this, uh, it's a complicated decision for all of them. So I wouldn't read too much into that for either the state or the defense, uh, uh, other than this family's trying to heal and uh, none of them wanted to, uh, to, you know, to speak publicly. Yeah. This has ripped that family apart because as we've heard from the testimony, this is a family that appeared to be very close. You don't always get along with your in-laws, but it sounds like they did. And so this has to be more painful than anything you could imagine. I think. Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. No, well, I was just going to say I, it was there was no there was no win win for them. It was a lose lose right. for them. I mean, obviously, um, at the end of the day, I mean, people have. I mean, this has become a salacious, scandalous thing that people with a lot of notoriety. It, this trial has become a character caricature of itself. And I'm just going to remind people that at the end of the day, two people were brutally murdered, and a family has been torn apart and, irre and irrevocably you know, harmed forever. I mean, the, I have a lot of compassion for the remaining family members. And so, we, to quote Creighton, we're being very sensitive about this. It was a very complicated situation that we're in, but our job was to bring justice to uh, Alec Murdoch and, and to bring it for Maggie and Paul, and that was our job, and we took it very seriously. I, I, this happens in homicide cases sometimes. You have to focus so much on the evidence that I feel like the victims do get kind of lost in a way, and, and you can't really focus on them as much because you're, try, you're trying to prove the case, and it becomes about the evidence. It becomes about whatever is being argued. Uh, it's also a strange situation because your office was prosecuting Paul Murdoch. Yeah. Um, that's something that doesn't happen. Um, you actually said, you know, we've heard a lot of bad things about per Paul Murdoch, but you had some kind things to say about him today. Well, absolutely. I mean, we have to remember that, uh, you know, people are always a mix of different things. Uh, and, you know, the, the, our office was po uh, prosecuting Paul Murdoch. That was not a case that was assigned to me uh, uh, personally. Uh, but, in, uh, you know, we also heard a lot of good things about Paul. We heard that he was how much he enjoyed life, how much his friends loved him, how he would help anyone. Uh, there was also the boat case, and ultimately that was significant to the case. And as much as that was bringing, uh, you know, possible criminal liability for him, uh, civil liability for Alec, which you know really helped uh, would help expose the reality of what he's been up to. Uh, so it was important, though, because this case was different. You know, you didn't have because of this complicated family dynamic, maybe the, the typical witnesses you might have to humanize uh, um, these victims. But they were real people, and they had uh, a, a lot of life left in them, and it was cut short by this defendant, and I'm glad the jury saw that and spoke the right verdict. There were a lot of questions. Uh, there are probably questions we'll never know the answers to, which drives me insane because I always want to know everything. Um, but there were a lot of, um, you know, you know, shots fired. I, that's a terrible thing for me to say in this case, but at the investigation in this case about, um, you know, Agent Owen and his testimony before the grand jury and him saying things like the T-shirt didn't have blood on it and uh, what have you. Uh, what is your response to the criticism of the investigation by SLED? Do you think it was thorough enough? And either one of you may address that. You go first. I'll follow. 
Well, absolutely it was. And you have to remember, I say investigations are like children. They're organic. You know, they grow. And when you start an investigation, you don't know where it's going to go. Uh, it can go this way. It can go that way. Just like a child ends up growing up, maybe a completely different from what you envisioned when they were first born. Uh, when... Uh, you know, and this this is what the defense does. They're going to say everything's a fabrication. They're going to say everything is malicious and, and intentional. But, you know, when uh, Agent Owen presented uh, evidence to the county grand jury, he relied on the evidence that he uh, had at the time and that he thought was appropriate. As the investigation went forward, uh, additional information came to light, and that was not any evidence that we relied on in front of this jury. And that's normal to assess evidence, to reassess evidence for new information to come to light. No, this is a straw man. The defense was firing at something the state never used. And let me remind you, the jury convicted him beyond reasonable doubt. And again, like Creighton was saying, I mean, cases evolve. One day you believe this is important, and then all of a sudden the next day you realize it's not important. There were a thousand pieces of data and information that we put before this jury. That was one data point, and we never even put it up. It's like the defense wanted to put it in there so they could then attack it to have the jury not look at the actual evidence that proved he was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Were there mistakes made with the T-shirt? You know, what I'm going to say is this. Um, Human beings are fallible. Law enforcement officers are human beings. We're all, we all make mistakes. And like you said, investigations, they evolve. Like, like Creighton said, they're organic. They evolve quickly. Information changes. Your position changes. And I like to say this. In order for there to be a second guesser, there has to be a first guesser. So coming in and second guessing every single thing law enforcement did or didn't do, um, I don't think it's fair. I think SLED did a phenomenal job. Um, I, I applaud them, uh, the Carlton County Sheriff's Department, the other law enforcement agencies and partners we worked with. I mean, they were just trying to get to the truth. They didn't have a beat on Alec. In fact, it, you, you heard uh, David Owen testify early on. There was a circle. You know, it's kind of like it's everyone's in the circle and no one's in the circle. Right. They have to start somewhere. Every, and, they eliminate. You start with everybody in and then... Right. No one's a target and, and no one's out. I mean, it could be anybody. And they were... They were Every time, every name they were given, they had to go talk to them. If someone sent an email in saying Bill Jones or John Doe was saying he didn't like, uh, you know, Maggie or Paul and wanted to hurt them, they'd have to go interview that guy and find an alibi. And that was taking officers off the street. They they followed every lead. They were pulling people out of that circle left and right every day. And they tried to do the same for Alec, but the information that he gave. It just never added up, and now we know why. It came. It was revealed on when he took the stand why his his side of the story didn't add up. So he actually validated and justified the fact that law enforcement was trying to get him out of the circle of suspicion and never could. Perfect segue. I think you were reading my mind, uh, Creighton. When did you learn that Alec Murdoch was going to take the stand? Well, I knew that he was going to likely take the stand when they first put in their first exhibit. Uh, under our rules, uh, once the defense offers any evidence, it changes the order of argument and gives the state uh, that last closing. Uh, I also knew from my assessment of, of Alec uh, who he was, and he was somebody who has been able to avoid accountability, who had been able to talk his way out of trouble, to convincingly lie uh, for, uh, for years and years and years. And so there was no doubt in my mind that he was going to believe that he could sit down in this courthouse and the county where he lives and look those jurors in the eye uh, and convince them that uh, that he uh, you know was not guilty of these crimes and that's why I did the cross examination in the manner I did this is a different kind of cross if you'd gone about it as a traditional cross it would have been a disaster I wanted him to talk I wanted to start out constructive I wanted to have long pauses because he couldn't help himself he'd start talking and I knew eventually he would end up lying on the stand in front of the jury, and they would see that, and they would see through that. So you wanted him to feel comfortable? Absolutely. I wanted to get him talking. I wanted to get him uh, explaining, because I've seen him do it. I've seen him do it on those interviews. I've seen him, I've talked to the victims of the white-collar cases, and so I know, uh, you know, he's confident in himself to do that. And he can also look the jurors in the eye and give that closing argument and, and do that. Uh, and so I wanted him talking, and uh, it, I think in the end, uh, he hung himself on a few things. I, it was very clear that he had very specific recall of things that don't seem to matter and no recall of the things that most people would find important. And, uh, and obviously, uh, you know, I haven't talked to any of the jurors, but I've heard that some of them have spoken and said that his testimony, uh, you know, was the kind of thing that really uh, made them realize that what he was telling them wasn't truthful. 
Alec Murdoch, as, as we've all heard and knew by reputation, was a very effective and successful you know, attorney. He was able, he, he built his career, a, a, a very successful career on standing in front of juries, probably in this very courthouse, in front of that very jury box, as well as the others, other courthouses in this area, um, making millions of dollars, doing brilliant closing arguments, connecting with jurors and getting them to believe him. And I truly believe in my mind that he viewed this as, his, as a closing argument. Taking the stand as a, as a witness in his own murder case was his way of, of giving a closing argument. And I believe that he felt that he could talk his way out of anything, as, as, as evidenced by things that he'd been doing for years. You know, the way he was playing the shell game with the money and getting people to believe this and do that and ripping them off. He thought he could do this again and manipulate this jury. And obviously, he ran out of, he ran out of um, runway. You know, uh, it was interesting to me uh, that you focused so much on the financial crimes. And I, the, the d first day, I was like, oh, my gosh, move past it, move past it. Were you just trying to get admissions? Is that why? Did you want him to admit to all of them? Well, no, it's more complex than that. And, and I get that people might have been like, okay, this is, why are we emphasizing this so much? But, you know, a fundamental question for any juror is, you know, what what's going on with this person that, that could possibly cause them to... Uh, kill their wife and son. And I know the, the defense tried to simplify that, that we were just saying that the, the motive was purely financial, and it wasn't that. What we were trying to show the jury was who this man really was, and the fact that he had been living on what I called a hamster wheel, this incessant roller coaster, for over a decade, an exhausting series where he had to constantly stay one step ahead of the game, and all of this was coming to an end. We wanted to show how important this family legacy was to him, and that was about to come to an end. We wanted to show how the boat case was putting pressure uh, on that and threatening to dispose Alex himself. And all of this was coming, I think I called it a gathering storm, a perfect storm, as we neared June 7th. And all of those pressures you know, were very consistent with, you know, in South Carolina you can't put in uh, evidence of psychological profiling and that sort of thing, but the word is family and Annihilator. And these were factors we'd identified in Alec that is a recognized psychological phenomenon of typically middle class, not middle class, excuse me, middle aged, uh, you know, often white males, uh, very successful who were facing the prospect of uh, a family breakup, dependency. Of, uh, drug dependency, yeah, drug dependency, family breakup, and financial ruin. Uh, and, you know, he fit that to a T. But it was also to explain this guy uh, and how unique this is as a situation. I don't think it could be underestimated, and I said this in sentencing today, that no one, no one who thought they were close to him, who thought they really knew him, whether it was family, whether it was his best friend, whether it was his law partners, whether it was his clients, whether it was members of the community, no one knew who this man really was. And the jury needed to understand that because I, I did think that he thought he was going to be able to get up on the stand and try to, uh, you know, put on a show and convince them that he was in fact innocent. And for a lot of people, it is a huge leap uh, to go to brutally murdering your wife and your son. And so Creighton had to get into not just his motive, but his, his uh, I guess, what he was thinking at the time, his state of mind. Andrea. I mean, he was right. I mean, he was living just on the precipice of total collapse for 10 years, and he was staying one step, one step ahead of financial ruin and family ruin, and it was catching up to him, and it was, he, he saw, like you said, an inevitable collision course that he was not going to be able to control, and this was a last gasp desperate effort to do that. I've said this a couple of times and, and it makes sense to me. I tell people all the time, in, in Alex's own mind, I do believe in his warped own way he loved his family, but he loved himself more than he loved them. And murdering them was the price that he was willing to pay to preserve his way of life. But it's so weird because we don't hear anything about domestic violence or issues in the marriage. I mean, it's weird. It's not usually usually how this works. I mean, that's the thing. He's been living a lie for so long. That lie was more important than anything. That prominence, that family legacy, uh, you know, his law career, his wealth, even though he wouldn't even concede that he was wealthy uh, to this jury, which I, okay. Um, you know, these, these things were more important to him. Uh, than uh, anything else. And again, it, it is weird, and I think I argued that to the jury. This is a unique situation. This is a unique individual, and uh, you need to look at it in that context. You can't look at it rationally because fundamentally crimes like this are never rational. What's next with the financial crimes? But, and that's a good point. That The financial crimes came up a lot in this trial but for that uh, that reason. But they're still out there, and I, I want to be clear. He's got a right to a fair trial on those. He's presumed innocent to those uh, 
those uh, charges are addressed. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I always uh, want to add that disclaimer, and it's not just a disclaimer. You know, those are fundamental parts of our system. But, um, you know, we plan to pursue those vigorously because there's an accountability about that that goes to the heart of the system that we're all a part of, uh, abuse of the, you know, alleged abuse of the those victims there that also needs uh, justice. I'm sorry, General. No, 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 I'm, I'm saying amen. Do you always it. call him General? <laughs> that's that's what you call him. To, 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 to my face, uh, when, when, I, when, I, boss when and, I walk, uh, Creighton's very respectful to yeah, me. Um, and occasionally, now I'm cool, so. No, that's yeah. fine. It's fine. We're friends. Um, I even lost. I forgot what I was going to say. Um, I, don't, I don't remember, boss. Sorry, I, I, had, to, I had to make that joke. No, we were we'll talking about the financial crimes. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh. Someone Any asked. Any deal to be offered? No. Well, well I'm not going to comment because they're pending. But uh, I will say that people have asked. You know, why? Why he's in prison? He's got a, you know double murder, consecutive life sentences. And in my view, and I think Creighton would say amen to this. I mean, there there are other victims who have a right and deserve to have their day in court. Uh, regardless of what his outcome is, what his destiny and his fate are. So they deserve to have their cases. If he wants to plead to those, he's free to do so. Otherwise, they'll get their day in court as well. All right. Gentlemen, thank you so much uh, again. I, I loved how you did Dr. Kenzie on rebuttal. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm trying to help my uh, teammate out. Yeah, I saw you that. Prep for it was a big assist. Right. And and congratulations on a uh, job well done. I know it's not easy. Uh, it's a, it was a long slog, uh, but you kept your cool. You you kept your cool. I was surprised some days with uh, the things going on. So well, I, I got to say this before we go. I had a, an amazing team. This is not just about the two right. of us sitting here. You saw all of them contribute. Uh, we've been, uh, you know, working together for a while, and I can't be more proud of all of them. And every one of them deserves uh, all the credit as well. And that also goes for SLED and Colleton County and Orangeburg and Charleston, and all our law enforcement partners. It's a team effort, and I wouldn't have survived without them. All right. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank so you. great to have you. All right. We'll be right back. You've been watching Law and Crime live from Walterboro, South Carolina. Stay with us.